So we're now going to talk about labor analgesia, uh, some of the various techniques that are available, kind of what's traditional out there, and also um, what's new and evolving in terms of labor analgesia. And I want to try to show you some of the evidence to support what we do. So first of all, as anesthesiologists, providing labor analgesia is a very important job for us. Um, in fact, labor has been reported to be one of the most painful experiences a woman will experience throughout her life. Uh, there's a McGill pain questionnaire that rates all different types of pain. Patients are asked to rate their pain. And in fact, women rated labor pain more painful than cancer pain. And in a particular group of patients, nulliparous patients who had not had any sort of prepared childbirth training, they rated labor pain as painful as cutting off a digit without anesthesia. So it is very significant pain, and we can really help our patients by providing good, effective pain relief. Um, but providing pain relief for labor, there's been some controversy um, in, about its use. For, for many years, even back in, in biblical times, it was controversial. Um, in the 15th century, midwives were actually burned at the stake for providing pain relief. But regardless of that, we've now moved beyond that. I will tell you that 20 or so years ago, there were still sometimes insurance companies not wanting to pay for labor analgesia unless there was, quote, a medical indication. But now uh, about 60% of women in the United States receive um, epidural analgesia for their labor. And ACOG is behind us in terms of providing neuraxial analgesia or any sort of pain relief for labor. They came out with this statement a little over 10 years ago where they said there is no other circumstance where it is considered acceptable for an individual to experience untreated severe pain amenable to safe intervention while under a physician's care. In the absence of a medical contraindication, maternal request is sufficient medical indication for pain relief during labor. And this statement came about because of insurers sometimes denying payment for labor epidural analgesia. But luckily, that has not been an issue for several years now. So in this lecture, I want to talk about some of the techniques that we're all very familiar with, such as traditional epidural analgesia, patient-controlled epidural analgesia, combined spinal epidural analgesia, but also a little bit of time talking about some newer techniques, such as programmed intermittent epidural bolus, uh, the options for systemic analgesia, especially in those patients who can't have neuraxial techniques, and something that's kind of up and coming and becoming more popular here in the United States is that of nitrous oxide. So the traditional epidural, it's been around for many years, and, and why? Well, there's lots of advantages. It provides excellent analgesia. An epidural provides you lots of versatility, and when someone's in early labor, you can get a small, nice segmental block. T10 to L1, but then you can extend it as she progresses into the second stage of labor, and you can extend it, the block for cesarean delivery also. And it's a technique that anesthesiologists are comfortable with. There are some disadvantages to a traditional epidural, though. One is, is that you do get some motor block, which may, if dense enough, interfere with a woman's ability to push. Uh, anyone who's been on labor and delivery for a few weeks knows you've got those epidurals that sometimes there seems to be missed segments, one-sided blocks that you have to troubleshoot. Uh, you also have to understand labor pain to know how to manage the epidural. During the first stage of labor, the contraction pain really is occurring as a result of the stretching and dilation of the cervix. and and the lower uterine segment, and so you need to be able to innervate the uterus. You need to block the innervation to the uterus, which is T10 to L1. But then when you get into the second stage, you also have the stretching of the perineum, which is uh, covered by the pudendal nerve. And so by the time you get into the second stage of labor, you need a block that's extending from T10 down to um, S4. So part of dealing with an epidural is is, of course, learning how to handle the one-sided blocks, the missed segments, but also knowing what type of block you need to keep the patient comfortable. Um, other disadvantages of epidural include hypotension. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the evidence out there in terms of how or does epidural analgesia affect progress and outcome of labor. 
and talk about the important topic of epidural analgesia and its effects on maternal temperature. Now, in terms of effects on the progress of labor, many years ago, back when I was a fellow, there was lots of, con lots of controversy about this. Uh, there was a, a retro there had been many retrospective studies that said there's an association between having an epidural and having a longer labor and having an increased risk of having a cesarean delivery for, due to dystocia, meaning um, labor not progressing appropriately. And then after all these retrospective studies, people said, well, there's lots of problems with retrospective studies. You know, patients that are having longer, more painful labors, they're more likely to request an epidural. So you really can't say that there's any clear association and certainly no causation. So then in, um, people started doing prospective studies. And the first prospective randomized study was done by obstetricians. And they reported in this study that both the first and second stage of labor were prolonged and the cesarean delivery rates were increased by tenfold. And in fact, the, pro the first author of this article actually started lecturing saying that women should, when they're consult consented for an epidural, should be told that if they get an epidural, they have a higher chance of needing a C-section. So the anesthesiologist didn't really think this was right. <coughs> After this first study, many, many um, more prospective randomized studies were done, and some of the most recent we data we have now is systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the many studies that are out there looking at the effects of epidural on the progress of labor. And so one of the most recent ones is from the Cochrane um, database of systematic reviews, which included uh, combined a series of randomized controlled trials so that in this systematic review there were more than 9,600 women that were studied and they compared the use of epidural analgesia to, to women who received either systemic opioids for their labor pain or they didn't receive any analgesia at all. Now they did show that there was a somewhat increased risk of instrumental delivery, be it uh, forceps or vacuum with a, a risk ratio of 1.42. Um, most importantly, though, they found that there was no increased risk of cesarean delivery and the first stage of labor was unaffected because you will have patients come in and they, they have it in their head that having an epidural is going to slow down their labor and prolong their labor. Uh, in terms of second stage of labor, there, are, there is data to suggest that having an epidural does prolong the second stage of labor by about 15 minutes is the average mean difference. Um, in most patients, though, that is probably not clinically significant, and I think most women in labor would rather have to have a second stage of labor that's 15 minutes longer than go through labor without adequate pain relief. Now, one question that has sometimes come up is the timing of an epidural. Uh, there are still some obstetricians that believe that if you put in the epidural too early, you are going to prolong labor. So. We're going to talk a little bit about the evidence there. I will tell you that the practice guidelines from the ASA for obstetric anesthesia um, state that neuraxial analgesia should not be withheld on the basis of achieving an arbitrary cervical dilation. And it should really be offered on an individualized basis. So there shouldn't be any, everyone has to be at least four centimeters dilated before they can get their epidural. And there's quite a bit of data out there now, evidence, looking at the timing of epidural placement and either the, the effect or no effect on, on outcomes of labor. This was a very large study of over 12,000 patients in which women were randomized to receive an epidural either in the latent phase of labor, defined as less than four centimeters, or in the active phase of labor, which was defined as four centimeters or greater cervical dilation. And they found that um, whether it was placed early or late, that there was no difference in the cesarean delivery or instrumented delivery rates, and there was no difference in the durations of either the first or the second stage of labor. Um, another systematic review, another study which was a systematic review assessed patients who received epidurals early, which they defined as less than three centimeters versus late, which was defined as being four centimeters or greater, and they looked at um, the obstetric outcomes. Uh, this was an, a large meta-analysis. There were over 15,000 patients, and they found that whether you received your epidural early or late, there was no difference in the risk of C-section or instrumental delivery. So in terms of timing, I think the, the, the feeling of 
the evidence and the way that we practice here at UK is that as long as someone is committed to delivery, they're going to deliver the patient, they're in a regular labor pattern, it doesn't matter how far dilated they are. If they're requesting an epidural, they are in pain, then they should be able to have an epidural. And there is should not be any, oh, you got to be at least four or five centimeters to get your epidural. Because the evidence doesn't support that it does affect labor outcome in terms of cesarean delivery rates, duration of labor, etc. So now let's talk about some of these techniques of, of labor analgesia. The traditional epidural, um, our goal obviously is to provide adequate analgesia while minimizing motor block. And as I said before, early in labor you want a block that extends from T10 to L1 for the innervation of the uterus and the cervix as, as your contraction pain is really primarily a result of dilation of the cervix. And then as you get into transition in the second stage and the fetal head is beginning to descend through the birth canal, you now also have somatic pain from the stretching of the vagina and the perineum. That is innervation from the um, pudendal nerve, which is S2 to S4 nerve roots. So that's your goal, is to provide adequate analgesia throughout labor. Uh, we generally, though, although we want women comfortable, we still want them to be able to push effectively. So generally we're going to use First of all, our choice of local anesthetic is going to be one that causes relatively less motor block, so that would generally be bupivacaine or rupivacaine, and in, in relatively low concentration. Most places here at UK, we use one-tenth percent. Most institutions are using anywhere from sixteenth to one-eighth percent of bupivacaine or ropivacaine. And then the other important thing is adding lipid-soluble opioids, because it's been shown that by adding some opioid that you decrease your local anesthetic requirements and thus should expect to see less motor block. And this was a nice study that looked at the addition of fentanyl to epidural bupivacaine. And um, it was a, a, a study where they were looking at MLAC, which is an up-down sort of study design where you give a patient a particular concentration or dose and then you change what the next person gets based on the response of the patient before them. So they looked at concentrations of fentanyl and concentrations of bupivacaine and found that as they increased the concentration of fentanyl in their epidural solution, the concentration of bupivacaine needed for the woman to be comfortable decreased. So important to add opioid to your epidural infusions. Now, I mentioned we were going to talk some about the effects of epidural on maternal temperature and maternal fever. So this, this issue dates back by many years. The first couple of studies were in the late 80s, early 90s, where it was reported that there was an association between epidural analgesia during labor and increased maternal temperature. Now, interestingly, these first two studies found that this temperature increase didn't start until four hours after initiation of the epidural. And generally, the increase in temperature was about a half to one degree Celsius. And in both of these studies, they didn't have any patients who actually developed fevers that they defined as greater than 38 degrees Celsius. So there were two studies that found that. And this is showing one of them um, where you, if you read the legend here, the patients who got epidurals either with just local or with local and fentanyl, um, at about four hours you start to see that rise in temperature. Now after this though, there have been subsequent many more studies. And in fact, some studies have found not only is there an increase in maternal temperature, but there's actually an increased risk of developing a clinically significant fever. One interesting study was what we call a natural experiment study, which is where you are at an institution, you make a significant change to practice. There are lots of assumptions in this type of study in that not much else has changed. You can't necessarily always assume that. But this was a study where they didn't have the resources to provide on-demand epidural analgesia. And so the number of the percentage of patients in labor at their institution who were receiving epidurals for labor was like 1%. Then they got staffing that now they any patient, if she was in labor and requested an epidural, someone's available to do it. So their epidural rate increased from 1% over this time period to 83%. And what did they find when they compared temp maternal temperatures before and after the availability of epidurals? They saw a three-fold increase in the number of patients who had a temperature over 37.5, and in terms of actual fever defined as greater than 38, they saw an 18-fold increase, 
once they had a large percentage of women receiving epidurals. There have also been randomized controlled trials that have also cons consistently shown higher fever rates in women with, with epidurals as compared to those without. And anywhere from 22 to 3, 33% fever rate with epidurals versus 5 to 8% in those who did not have epidural analgesia. So this really does seem to be an issue. Now, more recently, there was a study um, where they also looked at effects of epidural analgesia on maternal temperature, and they um, <clears throat> got an interesting result. They found that, yes, there, women can develop fever, but there seemed to be a subset of women who developed fever. And in that subset of patients, actually, the temperature started to rise at an hour. But, and that was about a quarter of patients, 22%. The other 73 to 75% of women who had an epidural, they didn't develop any significant increase in maternal temperature throughout um, the time of the study. And so the, the thinking amongst most people now is, is that there is a subset of women who will d develop fever. What causes them, we don't know. Uh, one of the things people are looking at in terms of research now is can we find risk factors and identify those patients who are going to develop fever. Those early studies from the 80s and 90s where they showed it didn't start rising into four hours, the feeling was that this was actually what's called an averaging effect, meaning that they were looking at all comers. And so it wasn't until you got to four hours where the significant rise in temperature among the subset affected the overall mean temperature. Um, <clears throat> so in reality, it seems that if you are going to have a rise in maternal temperature with your epidural, you're going to start to see it right away, actually. So it seems to be a phenomenon that definitely occurs. So then the question becomes, what's causing it? Um, not sure. Is it that the differences in patient population, obstetric management? Is it that the epidural alters thermal regulation? Is it that these women have great pain relief so they're not hyperventilating with their contractions, which we know would be a heat dissipating event if they were hyperventilating? Um, but I think a lot of people think that there may be some sort of exaggerated non-infectious inflammatory response in this set of patients who do develop epidural fever. Um, and in fact, it's been shown that um, having an elevated interleukin-6 level, which is an inflammatory marker, is associated with a higher risk of developing epidural fever. It's also been found, if you look at the placentas of women who develop the fever, that they also have a higher rate of placental inflammation. So why is this important? Well, from a maternal standpoint, if mom develops a fever during labor, as you know, the obstetricians are going to start antibiotics, and antibiotic therapy is not without risk or consequences. It's also been shown that women who develop fever during labor may also have an increased rate of cesarean delivery and instrumental, instrumented vaginal delivery, so maternal consequences. But maybe even more concerning could be um, the fetal effects, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this. So it has been shown, um, people have been able to do studies where they've looked at fetal skin temperature in laboring women. And in this one study from several years ago, when they measured fetal skin temperature, they found that there was a greater rise in temperature when the mother had an epidural. Um, for temperatures greater than 38 degrees Celsius, about almost a third of, of fetuses whose moms had an epidural had a, a temperature that high. And for a really high temperature, 39 degrees Celsius or greater, nearly 10% of, of fetuses whose moms had an epidural um, had a fetal skin temperature that high. So that can be concerning. What about for the neonate? Well, um, many years ago when a study came out showing an uh, association with ep a fever and epidural, it even made the lay press. And what they found was that um, babies whose moms had epidurals and then developed fever, that those babies were more likely to get worked up for sepsis, they were more likely to get antibiotic therapy, although they did find that there was actually no difference in actual sepsis rates, but they were more likely to have a workup because sometimes that is an indication by the NICU for a neonatal sepsis workup is that mom has developed a, a fever during labor. Um, what other data are out there? This was a, an interesting study in the pediatric literature a few years ago. 
And they looked at women who had epidurals and looked at outcomes for their babies based on the mom's temperature during labor. And they found that for all of the adverse outcomes they looked at, which included uh, hypotonia, a, a floppy baby, uh, needing assisted ventilation at delivery, low APGAR scores, and maybe most concerning is, is neonatal seizures, that when maternal temperature reached greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit during labor in women who had epidurals, that their babies, for all of these adverse outcomes, had an increased risk that was anywhere from two to six-fold higher than for babies whose moms did not develop that temperature. Uh, there have also been studies not looking specifically at epidural-related fever, but just fever in general during labor, and have found that there's an association between a maternal fever of at least 38 degrees or greater and cerebral palsy. In this one study, they reported there was a nine-fold increase in cerebral palsy if mom had a temperature over 38 degrees Celsius. Um, but is it the temperature itself or is it the underlying cause of the fever? Because there are similar odds ratios for cerebral palsy with other indicators of infection. So if it's due to the infection, then maybe a, a maternal fever related to epidural where there, it's been shown there isn't infection, maybe that won't have the same effect. Um, but there have been a couple of studies that have found an association between risk of cerebral palsy and maternal fever, although in one of those, when they did a multivariate analysis, they did not find fever to be by itself an independent risk factor. So again, bringing up the idea that maybe it's the underlying cause of the fever that is re related to this increased cerebral palsy and neonatal injury. Uh, this was another study done from a very large maternity hospital in, in Dublin. It was a prospective cohort study. And um, very uh, significant outcome was that they looked at women who developed a fever of over 37.5 during labor, and they found that it was an independent risk factor for neonatal encephalopathy with an odds ratio of 10.8, so very significant. Then they, um, that was just a <clears throat> initial analysis. They then controlled for confounding factors, like maybe, you know, that the patient had chorioamnionis. I, I don't remember specifically what all the confounding factors were that they controlled for, but even when they did that multivariate analysis controlling for confounding factors, there was still a strong association between temperature over 37.5 and neonatal encephalopathy, with an odds ratio now of about 5. So the big question, um, Really, I think, I think it's well established now that there is an association between epidural analgesia and development of maternal fever. But I think what really needs to be answered is, does that fever cause fetal brain injury? Um, and is that fever actually a marker for infection or inflammation, which is what's the real, um, which is actually responsible for any injury that occurs to the neonate? or the fetus, and you know, the question is there's still lots that needs to be investigated to answer these questions, um, and something that we need to be paying attention to. So generally what, what I think we can conclude about epidural fever is that it does happen in a, in a subset of women, about 20 to 25 percent of women. We do know from the studies that have been done that it's not associated with neonatal sepsis, um, but clearly there's some data showing that it certainly may have an effect on the neonatal brain, and so we continue to need to study what's its etiology, um, identifying risk factors of who might develop it, and then from there, ways that we can prevent it from actually happening. Now, we've talked about the traditional epidural, then got into a conversation about adverse effects of epidural. Now let's talk more about different techniques of ways of delivering analgesia through the epidural and um, may they be better, the same, better pain relief. How can we use the epidural rather than just a continuous infusion? Well, patient-controlled epidural analgesia here at UK, it's what we routinely use. That's not the case everywhere else. There are many institutions that do just use a continuous epidural infusion. Here we do use patient-controlled epidural analgesia. It's been around for a long time. The first study reporting its use for labor was in 1988, and this was a randomized study using 8% bupivacaine, and patients either got a continuous infusion at 12 cc's an hour, 
or they got a PCA with a, a small basal rate of five cc's an hour and then four milliliter boluses. And what they found in this study was that the patients who were randomized to the PCEA used less local anesthetic while achieving similar pain relief. So that was the first study. Um, since then, many other studies were done, ways to set up your PCEA, looking at infusion, a continuous infusion with PCEA or no continuous infusion, whatever. So there's a lot of studies out there, and that's prompted people to collect many of these studies and do a meta-analysis. So um, this was a meta-analysis done over 10 years ago now of randomized controlled trials that compared PCA without a basal infusion to just a continuous epidural infusion. And they found also in the PCA group that they used less local anesthetic, they had less motor block, which may be helpful in terms of pushing. And if you're on a busy labor floor, important to us is that they required less interventions by anesthesia personnel. So when you're busy back in the OR with a C-section and someone needs a bolus, you're less likely to be in that situation when you're using PCA than a straight epidural infusion. Um, despite the fact that there was less local anesthetic used, less need for interventions by anesthesia personnel, there really was no difference in the quality of pain relief that the patients reported or their satisfaction. And in terms of labor outcomes, there was no difference despite the fact that there was less motor block with PCA in the duration of labor or the mode of delivery. Um, now, one of the questions that comes up is, should you use a basal infusion or should you use no infusion at all? Um, potential adva advantages of an infusion are that you can get better analgesia and there may be less need for interventions by anesthesia personnel. Um, Clearly, um, it seems that studies have shown that when you use a continuous infusion, you will end up using a larger dose of local anesthetic. However, is that really clinically significant? Because in the studies that found that you used more local anesthetic, they didn't find any significant difference in motor block or obstetric outcomes. Um, and really, my feeling is whether or not to use a basal infusion is going to depend on your patient population. Um, here at UK, we do use continu uh, a continuous a back baseline infusion along with the PCA, and that works very well for our patient population. If you have a patient population that is very motivated, um, is really into following along with their labor, being actively involved, they may do fine without a basal infusion. Um, but I think you're just going to learn as you go out into practice your patient population and whether or not you need to use a basal infusion with PCEA. In terms of strategies for a PCA, like I said, um, you could use no basal infusion. People who've done that generally will use a PCA dose of about five cc's with a lockout anywhere of five to 10 minutes. If you're gonna use a basal infusion, you can either use a lower or a higher infusion, partly depending on each particular patient's labor um, in terms of how much pain they're having, their pain tolerance, et cetera. Um, but four to five cc's, eight to 10 cc's with either group, most people are going to use a similar PCA dose of about 5 cc's and usually with a lockout of anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Now the next thing which is newer that I want to talk about is the programmed intermittent epidural bolus. And the idea behind this is, is that you can give intermittent automatic boluses through your pump rather than using a continuous infusion for analgesia maintenance. The first study um, looked at the idea of giving a 6 cc bolus of the epidural infusion every 30 minutes instead of using a continuous infusion. And they found that with this programmed intermittent epidural bolus, as compared to the continuous infusion, that there was a lower bupivacaine dose used, that there were less rescue boluses needed by the patient. The patient reported higher satisfaction, although there was no difference in, in pain scores overall. And I, I will tell you, if you're interested in trying this technique, that it is available on the pumps, the epidural pumps that we have on labor and delivery. Now, um, there have been a variety of studies since then that have looked at programmed intermittent epidural bolus. One was looked at um, three different techniques. One was a, using a 2.5 cc bolus every 15 minutes versus 5 cc's every 30 minutes or 10 cc's every 60 minutes. So same total dose. And they found, interestingly, that when they used the more spread out, bigger dose, the 10 milliliters every 60 minutes, that there was less bupivacaine consumption needed. Um, 
to keep the patients comfortable, although overall pain scores and satisfaction did not differ between the groups, nor did differences in obstetric outcomes, be, were they, uh, there were none identified amongst three different groups. Um, another randomized controlled trial um, of 145 patients looked at breakthrough pain in patients who were getting either a continuous or a perfusion or the intermittent epidural bolus, and they used PCEA for that breakthrough pain, and they found that in the group with the programmed intermittent epidural bolus that they used less local anesthetic, they had less motor block, and they actually did see a difference in obstetric outcomes in that um, likely related to less motor block was that there was a lower instrumental delivery rate with the programmed intermittent epidural bolus along with PCEA for breakthrough pain versus a continuous infusion with PCEA. And this just um, is, shows you nicely how over time with the continuous infusion in terms of motor block that it progressively increased in the patients with continuous epidural, but not with the programmed intermittent epidural bolus. Um, another, it's been a meta-analysis that's actually looked also at programmed intermittent epidural bolus versus continuous infusion. And um, this was a meta-analysis of nine studies, of which there were about 700 patients. They also found lower local anesthetic usage for programmed intermittent epidural bolus. Um, in terms of in, instrumental delivery rate, um, other necessary interventions by anesthesiologists, they really couldn't conclude much because the confidence intervals were really too wide. So essentially this, this meta-analysis, the one difference they found was less local anesthetic use with programmed intermittent epidural bolus. Um, this was part of that study looking at um, duration of second stage and you can see with this study, if you look at the diamond, that it actually seems to favor the intermittent epidural bolus, but they really did not make that conclusion because as you can see for each individual study, it, it crossed over zero. So there was just too wide variation amongst the studies to, for them to make the conclusion that second stage of labor was affected by using a continuous epidural infusion versus an intermittent epidural bolus. But one thing that they clearly did find in terms of maternal satisfaction, that clearly the patients who got the intermittent epidural bolus technique um, definitely had higher satisfaction compared to those with continuous epidural infusion. So all these studies, for the most part, have looked at continuous infusion versus programmed intermittent epidural bolus. Um, but what we're using is PCEA, so that becomes a question. And, and there have been studies um, showing that using programmed intermittent epidural bolus to replace the continuous infusion part of a PCEA, that there are some advantages to that. Um, now, the pumps that we have here at UK do not allow you to do a combination of programmed intermittent epidural bolus and PCEA, so that's not an option for us. If we want to use it, we have to use straight just program intermittent epidural bolus with no option for epidural PCA. So I've not been using it much yet, but there are pumps out there where you can do the combination, and I think that's really where the money is going to be in using this technique, is that we replace that basal infusion of PCA with the program intermittent epidural bolus and then continue to offer the patient the, the ability to, to self-regulate um, PCA boluses. Now, combined spinal epidural analgesia, another tried and true technique, one that we use here um, primarily on certain subsets of patients, especially those who are progressing quickly. But I will tell you that when you go out into practice, there are definitely institutions where using combined spinal epidural, it's really the technique of choice for all of their low risk paternians who are requesting neuroxial analgesia. Now, in terms of, we all know how to do a combined spinal epidural, spinal needle through epidural needle, uh, but we've all had the time when we put this, we got a good loss of resistance, we seem to be in epidural space, and we put the spinal needle in and there's no spinal fluid. So why might that be? Well, this is a nice um, diagram out of Chestnut that explains probably the three most common reasons why you don't get CSF back. One is, is that 
With that spinal needle, you're tenting the dura, but you're not able to get all the way through the dura. Um, another is that you actually, your spinal needle is not long enough to reach the dura. Or I think what happens often is that you're off midline, and so you're actually missing the dura because you're off midline. I think that's oftentimes the most common reason why you don't get spinal fluid through your um, spinal needle when you've gotten a good epidural loss of resistance. In terms of using combined spinal epidural, uh, a variety of ways to dose early in labor, I like to use just an opioid, um, fentanyl, 15 to 25 mics, or you could use sufentanil. We don't use that here, but there are places that do. Or especially as they get farther along in labor, there, there's a woman who comes in, she's a multip, eight centimeters. I would generally use a combination of opioid and a small dose of isobaric bupivacaine. And there was a study that showed that the combination of fentanyl and bupivacaine intrathecally was synergistic, not additive. So there's a real benefit to using the two together. Now, one question that sometimes comes up when residents do combine spinal epidurals is, should I start the epidural infusion right away? Should I wait? Um, you know, it really depends on the situation that you are in. Although we don't have a protocol here, there are a few places that will allow women after a combined spinal epidural to still get out of bed and ambulate. If that is the case and the patient wants to ambulate, then absolutely I would delay epidural infusion until the intrathecal analgesia component is resolving and the patient's complaining of pain again. However, if she's going to stay in bed, um, in most patients, unless I think they're gonna deliver very quickly, I recommend initiating the infusion. Um, once you've um, done the spinal component. There was a randomized study that found that by initiating the infusion right away, that it actually prolonged the duration of your intrathecal analgesia um, in terms of re not requiring until later any further epidural boluses. And there, uh, there was no difference in motor block, however, in that study. Um, and this just shows you, though, um, the significant difference between those who had the epidural infusion started right away and those who did not. For the first 90 minutes, there wasn't much difference, but then when you got beyond that, two hours and beyond, you can see that when they started an epidural infusion, um, additional analgesia wasn't needed for almost 80% at two hours when they started the infusion versus those who didn't, and um, it, it 180 hours is still, um, you know, between 30 and 40 percent did not yet need any additional analgesia other than that baseline basal infusion of your epidural. So why would you do a combined spinal epidural? Well, one of the big advantages is in that patients like you get almost immediate onset of pain relief. Um, you're using predominantly opioids, so you get minimal motor block as compared to an epidural. Um, some studies that show that generally probably there's a lower epidural failure rate, which makes sense because if you did the spinal component and got CSF back, then you're probably in the right place. And there might be actually, I'm going to show you one study, some uh, advantageous effects on the progress of labor doing a combined spinal epidural with opioid um, early in labor. And this was a study that was published in New England Journal uh, about 10 years ago. It's, um, not many obstetric anesthesia articles make it to New England Journal, but this one did. Um, and it talks about the risk of cesarean delivery with neuraxial analgesia given early versus late in labor. That was the um, outcome that was being looked at when the study was developed. If you did a CSE early in labor, um, did it affect cesarean delivery? Now, I will tell you they only used opioids, so... They didn't use local anesthetic in the spinal component, so that's something to keep in mind. But this um, was designed to determine the effect of combined spinal epidural and early labor on labor outcomes. So it was a prospective study of over 700 women who were in spontaneous labor and less than, seven, and less than four centimeters dilated. And they were randomized when they requested analgesia at less than four centimeters dilation to either get a CSC with 25 mics of fentanyl or to not get neuraxial analgesia yet, and instead to get systemic analgesia, and their drug of choice was hydromorphone in terms of the systemic analgesia. So first of all, what they found was there wasn't any difference in cesarean delivery rates between those who got an early CSC versus those who had to wait till they were at least four centimeters and then just got a straight epidural. Um, and, and that was despite the fact that the median cervical dilation in the early CSE group was only two centimeters. 
at the time that they did the technique. There was no difference also in instrumental vaginal delivery rates. Um, of note, in the late group, the one minute APGAR score was lower. And what that seems to show is that in the late group, they're the ones that got systemic opioids, hydromorphone, early in labor. So even though it was several hours later, there seemed to be you know, some small effect probably on the neonate from those systemic opioids. But the very interesting thing that they found, and I don't think they really were expecting this, but they found that in the group who got the early intrathecal analgesia with fentanyl, that their duration of the first stage of labor was about 90 minutes shorter than those who got systemic analgesia. And many years ago, when obstetricians said, oh, you gotta be at least four centimeters dilated to, to get your epidural, if women were hurting before then, what did they get? They got systemic opioids to treat their pain. And this is showing, well, probably we shouldn't have been doing that because perhaps actually labor is longer when you get systemic analgesia early versus doing an intrathecal um, fentanyl technique. Um, and there have been other studies to support this finding also. An earlier study before the Wong study also reported more rapid cervical dilation in women who got combined spinal epidurals as compared to epidurals. And then Wong also did this same study design, but in patients who are undergoing labor induction versus spontaneous labor. And again, they reported a shorter labor for the group that was um, randomized to CSC. But as with any technique, there can be some possible disadvantages of a combined spinal epidural. One is, is that um, when you do a combined spinal epidural, you do your intrathecal analgesia, it gives you great profound pain relief. Until that starts to wear off, you don't really know that your epidural catheter is working. So as a result, um, some people, including myself, like to avoid this technique in patients who I think are at high risk for either an emergency C-section or for general anesthesia. So if a patient with a difficult airway, I personally want to put an epidural in and dose it and know the catheter works right away rather than doing a CSC. Um, but on the other hand, you know, as I said, there are studies that have shown that the success of an epidural tends to be higher when you do a CSC versus an epidural. There was one retrospective study where they um, reported a five times higher epidural failure rate at C-section when an epidural was placed during labor as an epidural only versus a combined spinal epidural. Um, so that is something to think about. Um, but the reason that I still avoid it in those patients that I think could be a difficult airway or are more likely to get an emergent C-section is that although my epidural failure rate may be higher with the straight epidural, I know immediately that it's failed and I can replace it. Whereas if I do a CSC and use some intrathecal fentanyl and buprofocane that lasts for an hour, an hour and a half, I won't know for over an hour whether or not the epidural catheter works. And if I have fetal distress during that time and I go back for a C-section, and my, I may find out my epidural is not working. In most cases, it's going to work fine, but there's that rare case where it doesn't. Um, other adverse effects of combined spinal epidural, um, puritis um, is common, can be respiratory depression. There have been case reports of respiratory arrest after CSE, and there, uh, when you look at these, it looks like potentially having previously received parenteral opioids during labor may be a risk factor. Um, whenever you go into the subright next space, there's concern about infectious complications. And then I want to talk a little bit about the potential effects of combined spinal epidural on um, abnormal fetal heart rate. And so there was a meta-analysis done that reported that compared to epidural analgesia with intrathecal opioids, there was a higher risk of fetal bradycardia with an odds ratio of almost two. Um, no effect on cesarean section rate, though. They were able to resuscitate in utero and avoid an emergency section in the this, this setting of fetal bradycardia. And they suggested that this, that this increased risk of fetal bradycardia may be actually due to uterine hypertonus because you get such profound, rapid onset of analgesia with intrathecal opioids that maternal catecholamine levels decrease, and then that can lead to uterine hypertonus because if you think about it, when you um, have preterm labor, for instance, you're using sometimes tributaline to try to decrease uterine tone. So if you have decreased catecholamine levels, you're going to have increased uterine tone. Um, this was a nice study um, that looked at this also, and it compared using um, two different CSE techniques and epidural. And in it, they compared three groups. So a large dose of sufentanil, a smaller dose of spinal sufentanil along with some bubicane, or just a straight epidural. 
And they found that in the high-dose CSE group, the 7.5 mics of sufetanil, which is a very large intrafecal dose, I will tell you, that there was a higher rate of fetal heart rate abnormalities as well as a higher rate of uterine hypertonus. So it seemed that maybe this proposed mechanism of that in that other study, this may bear that out. And then there was another more recent study, which also um, nicely, I think, showed this. They looked at patients who got combined spinal epidural versus those who were randomized to epidural. Um, they showed a significantly higher rate of increased uterine tone in the CSE group, also a higher rate of fetal heart rate abnormalities in the CSE group, and specifically um, higher rate of fetal heart rate abnormalities in association with hypertonus in the CSE group as compared to the epidural group. Um, and so it's important to realize that this can happen um, and be aware of that. I'm not saying it's a reason not to do a CSE because in all these various studies and in my own experience when it's happened, it usually responds very nicely to in utero resuscitation, meaning you know you put oxygen on mom. Um, if she has any sort of drop in blood pressure, you treat it. Um, if she feels like she's got a hypertonic uterus, you give some tributylene and um, they will do fine. In this particular study I just addressed, they did do in utero resuscitation. They didn't even use tocolysis and they still reported that they did not um, have any patient who required an emergency C-section. So just something to be aware of and to make sure if, if you do do a CSC and right away you have fetal bradycardia that you let the obstetricians know what you've done and that this may have contributed to it and that with the usual maneuvers it's unlikely that we should have to run back for an emergency C-section. Um, now, is CSE versus epidural, what do we know about comparisons in terms of is one better than the other in terms of pain relief, outcomes, etc.? So um, this was a randomized controlled trial that looked at combined spinal epidural versus epidural in a private practice setting. So, um, you know, type of practice many of you might be in in a few years. And one thing they were looking at was, you know, there was the studies that have shown a higher failure rate with straight epidural. Those all came out of teaching institutions where you have people who are less experienced in neuraxial techniques. So this is a large OB, private practice, um, very skilled, experienced anesthesiologist. They actually found in that particular setting that there was no difference in epidural replacement rate between epidural and combined spinal epidural. Um, they did find in terms of using a CSC, not surprisingly, that the time to complete analgesia was shorter. And they did report better analgesia in terms of pain scores. So I would concede, I would say this is a statistically significant difference, but I don't know that there's much of a clinical difference between a mean pain score of 1.4 out of 10 versus 1.9. Um, they did also find, though, with the, the CSC, there was less need for top-up doses, which with your busy service, that's important. Uh, they did also report a higher rate of fetal bradycardia um, with a CSC, 8.5 versus 4.5% for the epidural group. Um, but again, no increased rate of cesarean deliveries. And now there's also, um, just about a year and a half ago, there was actually a meta-analysis looking at CSC versus epidural, 10 randomized controlled trials. Uh, they did find that with CSC that there was a lower risk of a uni unilateral block. Um, but they also, just like the study from the private practice, did not see a uh, a significant difference in the need for epidural catheter replacement with this epidural versus a CSE, and no difference in epidural top-ups either. So the one difference they found was less unilateral blocks with a combined spinal epidural, which kind of makes sense because if you do an F a CSE and do not get spinal fluid back, oftentimes, as I showed you before, the mechanism of that is that you're off the midline. And so if you're off the midline with your epidural, your epidural is more likely to be one-sided. Uh, and then also Cochrane Database system of Systematic Reviews has also looked at CSE versus epidural. Um, and they found that compared to low-dose epidural, again, faster onset of analgesia. Not surprisingly, um, there was more puritis, but they did not see any differences in maternal satisfaction, um, the need for rescue analgesia by the anesthesiologist, mode of delivery, the rate of posterior puncture headache, or um, neonatal outcomes in terms of APGAR scores or umbilical pH. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about neuraxial analgesia because that's mostly what we do. But as we know, there are sometimes patients who can't have neuraxial analgesia. So then we need to do systemic labor analgesia. So what can we do to make 
that as effective as possible. Now, well, first of all, we know that systemic labor analgesia is never going to be as effective as interaxial analgesia. Because we're giving it systemically, we have more of a concern about neonatal depression, as well as maternal respiratory depression and sedation. Um, but, you know, sometimes that's, that's all you can offer a patient who's got a platelet count of 30,000 or, or, you know, other reasons. So one thing that we as anesthesiologists can do is to offer these patients IV remifentanil. And those of you who've done OB, you know that we do use this in that particular patient population. So what are the advantages of using IV remifentanil as compared to using other systemic opioids? Well, it's a rapid onset. It's potent. It's ultra short acting um, because it's metabolized um, by plasma and tissue esterases. So you would expect to see less neonatal depression. Uh, the one big disadvantage of it over other opioids is it has a very short duration, which means that it requires very frequent dosing. Um, this was actually a meta-analysis that looked at using remifentanil versus meparidine um, PCA. And they found that with remifentanil, there was a lower mean pain score, lower conversion rate to epidural. So these were patients who were getting either of these drugs systemically but could still have an epidural if they wanted it. They, um, and less of those with remifentanil felt that their pain relief was inadequate to the point that they needed an epidural. And the women with remifentanil also had higher satisfaction. There were very few adverse events in either group, so they really weren't able to compare outcomes in terms of adverse events. Um, this was another recent study that looked at remifentanil IVPCA to um, patient-controlled epidural analgesia. It was small, 40 patients. But they did find, not surprisingly, with the PCEA that the pain scores were Low, lower. However, paternal satisfaction was similar between the remifentanil PCA and the PCEA, uh, but they did see s some respiratory effects of remifentanil. The, the moms who got remi had a lower mean respiratory rate, although the mean was still 18. Lower mean saturation, again though, it was still close to 97%, but what was concerning was they did report nine apnea events. They were short, but nine apnea events, and those were all in women who were getting remifentanil. So that is one concern. Um, there also was a meta-analysis comparing IV remifentanil PCA to epidural analgesia that included five randomized controlled trials. Um, not surprisingly, pain scores were higher with remifentanil. Uh, in terms of adverse effects, no difference in puritis or nausea and vomiting between epidural analgesia and IV remifentanil PCA. And um, in terms of neonatal outcomes, umbilical artery pH, there was no difference either, which is reassuring in terms of the effects on the, the fetus and neonate of the remifentanil. In terms of um, other adverse outcomes, the confidence intervals were too wide for them to really comment on that. So if you're gonna use IV remifentanil PCA, how are you gonna dose it? You know, there's a variety of studies out there. Really, there hasn't been an optimal dosing strategy established yet. Most studies will recommend 0.25 to 0.5 mics per kilo of your PCA dose with a a lockout of about two to three minutes, so the women have to be pushing the button very frequently um, because it takes a little time for it to, to reach its peak effect. It's recommended that you tell the woman to administer the dose as soon as she feels a contraction starting, so it should be peaking at the time that the contraction peaks. And generally, people are not using background infusions. There was actually a randomized controlled trial that compared um, remifentanil PCA to a continuous infusion of PCA with the idea being that maybe a continuous infusion would be better because it's such a short-acting drug, but they actually found that the patients with the PCA had lower pain scores and there was no difference in terms of adverse events for mom or baby between the two different techniques. Now if you can do IV remifentanil PCA, you know, we have an order set that's available in the, the workroom, but I, I think you shouldn't have had recent other opioids these patients definitely need continuous pulse oximetry and frequent respiratory rates like every 15 minutes as well as sedation. I actually insist on one-on-one -on -one nursing care. I know there are some other institutions that don't insist on that, but I do. If, if they're going to have remifentanil PCA, I don't want that nurse leaving the room um, frequently to check on another patient. And then finally, I wanted to end just talking a little bit about nitrous oxide, because as you go out into practice, you, this is becoming more common in the U.S. It's been used in the U.K. forever, um, and more and more institutions in the U.S. are now offering it. Um, compared to epidural analgesia, it's not invasive. That's its advantage. It's less effective, and in a lot of places where they use it, they say it's often used early in labor when the, the lab pain's not so bad and then converting to an epidural.
In terms of effects on the neonate, there's really limited data, um, but what data is out there shows that APGAR scores are not significantly different compared to other analgesic techniques. Uh, how does it work? Um, potentially, probably a combination of endogenous opioid release, NMDA receptor inhibition, which then reduces hyperalgesia, as well as um, some anxiolysis mediated, mediated by the GABA receptor. So a combination of those three is what people think results in it being somewhat effective in, in labor pain. If you're going to use labor analgesia, it needs to be self-administered um, via face mask. And um, generally, because of its onset time of 30 to 50 seconds, what they recommend is that the woman sort of get familiar with her labor pattern in about 30 seconds before what should be the next contraction. So she's having contractions every three minutes. Um, after the last contraction at two and a half minutes, start inhaling. You do need specific equipment, um, and the, the nitrous oxide machine has to have a demand valve that's capable of um, intermittent delivery of high volumes. Uh, the one most common machine out there is Nitronox. It needs to also obviously be able to blend oxygen and nitrous because you're going to use a 50-50 mix. You don't want any more than 50% nitrous oxide, and it needs to scavenge. Nitronox does that, and that's the one that's been out there for a couple years. I heard at a meeting recently that there's another one out there on the market now, too, that's available. Um, in terms of what monitoring you need, if you're using just nitrous oxide, then that's felt that it meets the ASA criteria for anxiolysis minimal sedation, which means that you don't need any extra monitoring, don't need pulse oximetry or anything. If you're going to use it in conjunction with systemic opioids, then generally it is recommended that you use continuous pulse oximetry. So that's about nitrous oxide. And just to conclude then, um, as anesthesiologists on OB, providing labor analgesia is very important, something that our patients, our nurses love us for. Um, in the U.S., you're going to find the majority of laboring women are going to request our services. Older analgesia techniques like straight epidural, combined spinal epidural, provide great, safe, excellent analgesia. But there are some newer techniques out there to think about using, like programmed intermittent epidural bolus. Um, maybe we can get ourselves a nitrous oxide machine here. Um, and then in those patients who aren't candidates for neuroaxial techniques, we should step up and, and um, volunteer to help out the obstetricians by offering IVPCA with short opiac opioid like remifentanil. And that is labor analgesia in a nutshell.